next chapter is on preferences, and you are probably all familiar with this central term of neoclassical economics. Um, it may be surprising for you that there is a philosophical discussion about this term, because uh, usually one uh, supposes that central terms of a discipline are rather clear, everyone knows what they mean, and so there is no philosophical discussion or anything like that necessary. But you will see this is really different, and it's really one of the, the interesting conceptual discussions in philosophy of economics, and uh, I present some of these things to you today. So the literature is this. These are all supplementary texts. The, the discussion has been uh, quite strong within the last uh, decade or two decades. Um, that's a text um, I'm referring to from Hausmann, um, I say something to the guy a little later. It's a book, and uh, it's uh, three book chapters, three and a half book chapters. And then there is a recent, a rather recent uh, journal article, Preference and Posit Positivist Methodology in Economics. Then from Angna, what preferences really are. But we're going to discuss this article. Uh, then from uh, Francesco Guala, Preference is neither behavioral nor mental. That sort of alternative I'm also discussing. And very recently from Johanna Thoma, uh, she's at LSE in defense of revealed preference theory. Uh, so this is a sort of backlash again, uh, counter movement, uh, and we'll see what that all means. And I had um, uh, suggested to you that you read at least one of these articles. Now, this is the outline, the standard view uh, that you are probably all familiar with from your undergraduate uh, classes. Uh, Microeconomics 101 is to reveal preference theory. Then I will contrast that with Horsman's view. Uh, namely that Horsman's criticism of revealed preference theory, then Horsman's view of preferences, and then a model of choice, which exemplifies then what uh, Horsman thinks about preferences. And then finally, uh, Agnes' criticism of Horsman. Uh, and the situation is that the, the discussion is completely open. So there are all kinds of discussions. There's no consensus uh, in philosophy of economics on that matter. So it's really open and nobody really has a, has a, a standard opinion. So the standard view is revealed preference theory, and preferences are obviously at the core of neoclassical economics in phase two, uh, and you are familiar with that. Uh, and the application of the concept of preferences is in many cases of positive economics uncontroversial. So you probably have calculated some examples uh, during your undergraduate studies where you apply preferences to some model situation, and then and you know, and it works, and you know what you're doing. So it seems to be quite uncontroversial. Uh, however, what preferences are is controversial as soon as the question is asked, which is a standard situation, by the way. Things seem to be clear until you ask a question. That's a classical topos in classical philosophy. So Augustine, I think, said, I, of course, I know what time is, but as soon as you ask me what is time, then am I in trouble? And this is the, very similar here. You, so economists know what they're doing when they uh, jiggle around with preferences. But as soon as you have to ex say exactly in a general definition or something, an explication of what preferences are, then controversy begins. Um, and that holds especially with respect to behavioral economics and neuroeconomics, which substantially deviate in their understanding of preferences from neoclassical economics. We'll see that in more detail, in greater detail, than in uh, section 7 and 9, when I discuss behavioral economics and neuroeconomics. And then we'll see they have a, a, a substantial change in their understanding of preferences. But in order to understand that change, of course, one has first to understand what's the view on preferences by neoclassical economics, and that's the standard view, uh, revealed preference theory that I'm uh, presenting now. But I hope that will be just very nice and warm memories for you, you know, during that the old days when you were still an undergraduate student, right, and looked up to the graduate students. Now you're a graduate student yourself. Okay, so the standard view of preferences, what is it? Well, it says something like preferences provide an ordering of alternatives to choose from. So, for instance, in consumer theory, from, a bun from bundles of goods, and these alternatives, uh, they describe which alternative an agent would prefer in comparison to the other alternatives. So the agent gets a certain range of alternatives, and the preference uh, say, describe, express what the agent, how the agent would choose. So it's an ordering of alternative to choose from. 
Uh, preferences obey certain axioms, especially axioms of completeness and transitivity, and sometimes explicitly choice determination and context independence. You can read about that in Horsman if you are uh, more interested in it. Uh, those of you who are not that mathematically minded will not uh, have loved these axioms, but they, if you look at the mathematical formulation of neoclassical economics, of course, they're absolutely central. Um, preferences can, under certain conditions, namely if, they, if and when they fulfill certain axioms, can be represented by a utility function. And the utility function is also something very practical, because then you can describe in standard neoclassical economics agents as rational utility maximizers. So you can say how someone who has certain preferences will choose, because the agents will, in standard assumptions of uh, neoclassical economics, rationally maximize utility. Okay. Now, it's very important that you remember that the rationality concept there is minimal. So when economists speak about rationality, they have a, typically, in microeconomics, a minimal understanding of rationality, which does not cover all the uses we have in everyday life in other contexts about rationality. Right? Roughly, it is only that following, uh, obeying the axioms averts money pump situations, that if you just f uh, follow the, your preferences, that you lose all your money. That's forbidden if, you've, if uh, you have especially transitivity in the axioms. But that's, of course, not all. Being rational concerning money does not only mean that you just don't want to lose money. That's not all to it. So be very careful when economists speak about rationality. It's a very restricted meaning. And, of course, in philosophy of economics, that's often um, uh, emphasized. But in, uh, usually in economics, they just speak about rationality. And economists got used to that use of the term of rationality but it's different from the everyday understanding. Again, this is nothing special of economics. When physicists speak about force, they mean something else in comparison to our everyday understanding. When physicists speak about inertia, they don't mean the same thing as what we mean in, in everyday life by inertia. So it's very typical that fundamental concepts in the sciences are used differently than in everyday life. The only thing is you have to be aware of it, especially when you speak to non-specialists, right? Because if you, to, if you speak to non-specialists as an economist and you speak about rationality, then this is the invitation for all kinds of misunderstanding because the other person will usually then understand rationality in the everyday sense, and that's not identical with the economist's sense. All right. So... In, the, in this view, utility maximization and choice are synonymous. That's a citation from a paper, a famous paper by Gould and Pesendorfer, which play, will play a role in Chapter 9. I cite it there. So uh, there you find in Chapter 9, uh, you, you find the quote uh, from that book. So utility maximization and choice are synonymous, which is, of course, first of all, a little disturbing because you think, well, one thing is having sort of preferences and the other thing is really choosing, and that's called synonymous. Well, that's how economists speak. Um, and there are three important points about this view of preferences that one should know. The first one, fundamental for neoclassical economics, is that preferences are not something mental or psychological. Mental is the standard term in philosophy of mind there. So usually we would say something psychological, so something inside your head, whatever that, wherever that is, right? Inside your head, okay? Um, and preferences are not something mental, but they should be seen as only shorthand to express or represent choices. So they are not conceptually different from choices. That's very important. Because in everyday language, preferences are something else than the choices themselves. Preferences may be, be behind choices or causing choices, but they're not exactly the same. But here in this view, as it is used in uh, economics, they are uh, synonymous, as uh, Gould and Pesendorfer say. And this can be called a behavioral understanding of preferences. Behavioral, because the preferences are seen in behavior. Right? And not in something mental. That's uh, the, the opposing view. And we will see that in behavioral economics and neuroeconomics, that will be ch changing. So it will become something mental and even worse or worse, something neuronal. So it's very important that in neoclassical economics, you have this very, so to speak, formal or mathematical understanding of preferences. Uh, it's something, it's just an auxiliary term uh, to describe uh, choices. 
And that is, of course, in agreement with phase two of neoclassical economics, in which, as I told you in my uh, caricature of the history of economics, uh, that uh, all the references to psychology has been, have been er erased from economics in the second phase. It's the spirit of positivism and behaviorism. And about positivism, I talked already, and behaviorism, the spirit uh, I, I will talk about in section seven. So this is just at, at the core, so to speak, ideologically or, or, or conceptually, at the core of neoclassical economics, that all psychology has been erased. And it's a purely behavioral uh, understanding. And behavior, you have to understand, it just means it's a translation from choices and nothing more. Right? So it doesn't add anything to choices. So the second thing that many economists stress is that economics has no ambition to explain preferences. Economists only measure preferences, right? observe them and measure them, and then use them to predict stuff. But economics, it, economics has no ambition to explain the preferences. They do not study their causes. This is left to psychology. That's the idea. Oops. There we are. So economists say, look, we just measure what the preferences are. And, uh, economy and, and psychologists may ask why they are there or how they were formed or anything like that. But we economists, we just measure them. And then we do build our models on the basis of measured preferences. And uh, one can say, put that this way, that economy, economics predicts and explains choices on the basis of preferences. And of course, these preferences reflect earlier choices. So you go in economics, in neoclassical uh, economics, you go from choices to choices. And in between, you have these auxiliary terms, preference and utility. But they don't add anything new, right? It's just from preferences to preferences, period, right? Uh, fr uh, from choices to, uh, to choices, and choices are observable. Now, the third point is that's very important, and that became important uh, during the last uh, two or three decades, uh, that people realized that the concept of preferences uh, has no inbuilt selfishness, no egotism, you know, to just, you just look for yourself. That is not inbuilt. In many models, of course, it is used that way, but it's not a conceptual part of preferences. And you see that, for instance, during the last two decades, there was much discussion about other regarding preferences. And there can be other regarding preferences of various kinds. For instance, you may have preferences that are in inequality averse. So you do not choose something that increases the inequality to other people in the same sort of situation or game. So that may be your preference. So in other words, if you translate, preference is just a translation from choices. Your choices are such that you do not disregard others, especially you do not disregard if the inequality between you and the others will increase. So and if you, there are people who want to avoid that. And then you can describe that, that the preferences are other regarding. So it's very important because sometimes, perhaps only undergraduates uh, from bad universities, so none of you, I guess, uh, think that preferences are just always egotistic. It's always me, you know, I'm, I'm it's me and, and only. That's not inbuilt in the concept of preference. You can use preferences like that, or you can measure preferences of egotistic people. Of course, you can do that, but that's not inbuilt into the concept. Okay. <clears throat> 